can live for three weeks without food, three days without water, but only three minutes without air. Why do you think it's so difficult to communicate the urgency of the problem to people, despite the fact that they are literally breathing the problem in and out every day? Well, partly it's literally it's invisibility. You know, I cycled here across London and you don't see the air pollution around you. I didn't see the air pollution I was exposed to. But it's also we've just grown used to it. You know, you've grown used to the fact that you live in a, a polluted London. And it's very difficult to get people to actually say, you know, yes, this is a problem and to appreciate it. Have also, no one dies with air pollution on their death certificate. Air pollution causes people to die through other things, be it heart attacks, strokes and so forth. So in that way, it's kind of invisible to us, but it's really there. What would, if I put you in charge now, what would be the first thing you'd do in terms of public policy to, to begin the process of turning this oil tanker around? Well, I'm a scientist, unfortunately not a politician to no, have to I make know. these changes, but if you look at all the solutions that are out there, the one that can give us most bangs for our bucks is to tackle transport, and mainly it's to get people actually moving themselves rather than in cars. So if we can reduce the amount of traffic on the roads and get people walking and cycling, you can tackle air pollution, you can tackle climate change, you can tackle urban noise that plights so many people living by roads, yeah? And also we can tackle the issues to do with obesity and just the lack of everyday exercise in our lives. And again, I find myself wondering, the tabloid journalism, of course, is superb at frightening people and, and making them fearful of things that they've got no need to be frightened of. The, the failure to make people fear air pollution when it genuinely is going to impact upon their lives in a, in a way that is about as grim as it's possible to imagine. It's, it's probably the greatest challenge for our times, is it? Alongside climate change, yes, yes it is. It, it is an enormous challenge. I wouldn't want people to be fearful of air pollution. You want people to take action. You want people to do things in their life Chicken and to an persuade egg, their politicians. You need, to be, you need to have your mind focused. Right? You do, yeah, but I wouldn't like fearful. people to be fearful, you know, as they well, go I, out in their I'm everyday lives. I'm not going to lie to you, because I, 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 I accidentally ended up talking about my own child's school the other you day. Did. did you hear that? The... the, the, the Two schools in Chiswick. The Chiswick Oasis is the umbrella organisation that's seeking to make really meaningful change. Because they've shut playgrounds now, outdoor play, because it's five yards from, from a very, very busy road. I, that does frighten me. That is, that is a, a future that if things, if measures aren't one, taken, one of the will things, get worse. Yeah, one of the things that frightens me to do with kids is the, a new study came out about a week and a half ago done in East London. And what we did was we found that children living in polluted areas are growing smaller lungs. No way. And you've got to say, maybe that doesn't mean so much for the kid unless they want to be Mo Farah. Yeah, yeah, of course. But if you think about the elderly relatives in your family and their health conditions as they get older, you, you know, you have this vision of elderly people fighting for breath. Mm. If they've grown up with smaller lungs by that point then we could be really storing up problems for the next generations to come and so something needs to be done and something urgent the, and the book addresses it from a global perspective rather than a, a the book's a, a, actually set very much in london i, I work in london uh, and it talks about much of the evidence that we've learned from london everything from the london smogs which have recently been on yeah, uh, you know on TV netflix shows, yeah. yeah yeah been done very well there all the way up to the modern issues to do with like diesel cars and wood burning that we face today but it is a global problem if you look about nearly half the world's population live in southeast asia and if you look at the pollution problems that are being experienced in delhi in yeah, beijing gotcha. at the moment you know that's globally that's where the major problems are but your book addresses things that people listening to this program could actually help to improve today as opposed to you know, lifelong dedication to, to global Yeah, I issues. mean, there's there's a number of things you can do yourself. You can think about the way in which you travel around the urban area, yeah, just take a back road rather than walking along a busy road and you can halve the pollution you're exposed oh, to. Gosh. But you could also try not to be part of the problem I'm as well. Yes, I get that. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of a word now to describe the book because I don't want to say frightening because you don't. I mean, you're, you're, I understand your point. Enlightening. Enlightening. And, and concerning. Uh, in, concerning. And urgent, empowering. Empowering maybe. and <laughs> urgent. The Invisible Killer. Gary, I should have added, is a pollution scientist at King's College London. The Invisible Killer, the rising global threat of air pollution and how we can fight back.